Okay, so now let's talk about fragility functions a little more specifically. So here we're trying to think about quantifying the probability of failure. And we're going to use a function that's defined using this equation on the screen and plot it out on the right is what these things look like. So it's very common, not quite universal, but it's extremely common model is to use a log normal cumulative distribution function for these fragility functions. Okay. So we could certainly use a different function, a uh, different functional form here. A lot of the concepts wouldn't change. We would just uh, have a slightly different uh, equation for computing these probabilities of failure. That said, 90% plus of fragility functions are log normal cumulative fragility functions. Okay, so this equation, let's talk this through here. So we, I'm going to write PF, where F is denoting failure. And that's that binary outcome that we were discussing in the previous video. It could be a collapse, it could be a occurrence of damage, it could be a building closure, so, something that we can define yes or no, that happened in a given situation. It's going to be conditioned on some intensity measure level. So we'll, that we'll specify the X amplitude of the ground motion intensity measure in terms of a peak ground acceleration or a spectral acceleration, something like that. And then the right hand side is what we're going to evaluate. So we've got the capital fee here. So that's denoting a standard normal cumulative distribution function. Just right at CDF is the shorthand for cumulative distribution function. Okay, and then the logarithm inside of that normal CDF is what's flipping it over into a log normal CDF. The X in the numerator is the ground motion intensity that we're going to specify for whatever we're interested in. And then we have these other Greek letters, so it's theta and beta. These are the parameters that are going to set the location of this fragility function. So those are going to be two numbers that are going to move this fragility function around in space. Okay. We could define those. So the theta value is the median. So it's going to be the x value at which the probability of failure is equal 0.5. So in this plot over on the right, we can see the, the probability of failure of 0.5. I've actually drawn it in with some dashed lines. So we can tell that theta is equal to 0.5 in this case. That's where the fragility function is evaluating into 0.5. Yeah. So we'll end up with looking back up at that function when x is equal to theta. We have a 1 inside that parentheses in the numerator. The log of 1 is 0. Then it doesn't matter what the denominator is. This phi evaluated at 0 gives us a 0.5. All right. And then the beta is the kind of the log standard deviation. So it's the standard deviation value for the normal distribution. Since x is in log units, it's the standard deviation of the log of the, this under, underlying random variable. Okay. And so what will happen is that bigger beta will give us a flatter function. So what I mean by that? So the x value at which the fragility function equals 0 0.5 will be unchanged. But the as you move above and below that theta value, the changes in probabilities will be slower as beta gets bigger. And then this functional form of the log normal CDF is maybe not totally intuitive. So what the kind of physical interpretation of that is as follows. So we could think about the idea that this, the system that has this fragility function has some capacity to resist shaking. Right? And we just don't know how much capacity it has. We don't know the shaking level at which it would fail. So we could say the intensity measure that would cause a failure it has a log normal distribution with this theta and beta. So then we could say at some given level of shaking, what's the probability that it fails? That would be the probability that the capacity of the system is less than the shaking that it experienced. And, and so that would be a log normal CDF calculation. What's the probability that the capacity is less than some number? And so that's an interpretation that's consistent with this log normal CDF or, or just general CDF formulation, even if it's not log normal. The log normal CDF or CDF in general is also convenient in that the probabilities go from zero to one as the intensity measure goes from small to big. So that's also practically convenient. Okay, so that's our functional form here and some notes about that. So let's talk about damage states for a minute. So again, we've talked about this binary outcomes. We can also think about multiple damage states and we can still continue to use fragility functions. So we can think about there's different types of damage that we might experience. So I've got some photos over on the right of from some fragility studies of we could think about a house tipping off of its foundation. That's one type of damage. We could think about cracking in walls for a different type of building in the lower figure. That's another type of damage. And so what we oftentimes do is we'll specify multiple damage states, and those kind of are sequentially getting more severe. 
has us, which we can discuss in a separate uh, context. That's a common loss assessment methodology um, for the United States, but used in other contexts as well. It specifies four damage states. So the descriptive words are slight, moderate, extensive, and complete damage. You can just intuitively understand those to be getting worse in, in the consequences of those damage states. So we get progressively more severe. So there is some ordering here, which is important. That if I'm in the extensive damage state, I'm worse than the moderate damage state or worse than the slight damage state. And that has us gives detailed descriptions of these states. So it's not just that somebody walks up to a building and says, oh, that seems moderate. That there is a, a, a set of criteria that, that hopefully different assessors would come to the same damage state definition if they were to observe a damaged building after an earthquake. And we've got multiple damage states, not just this binary outcomes anymore. And they are ordered from less to more severe. All right, so when we've got these multiple damage states, we can now generalize our fragility function approach a bit more. Here, what we've done now is instead of the failure criteria for this function over in the upper right, we've now got a damage state variable, and there's multiple discrete outcomes. And so this is the minor, moderate, extensive, so on. And then we're going to specify a specific damage state here. So the I subscript here is going to indicate the ith possible damage state. And these are going to be ordered from small to large in, in severity. So bigger I implies a, a kind of more severe damage state. And then, so that now the rest of the proceeds as previously. So we're still going to condition on the intensity measure. We're still going to have a normal, a log normal CDF over here. Now the theta and the beta parameters are going to have an I subscript because we're going to have a separate fragility function for each level of this damage state. Okay. And for an example, there's a set of parameters uh, given over on the left. And now we've got four damage states and we can even number these up. So I can see because the theta values are going from small to large, that's going from the smaller, less severe damage states to the more severe damage states. Uh, these are some parameters taken from Hazus for a given type of building. We can see that the theta values are getting bigger with more severe damage states. The beta value is actually the same for all the damage states, um, which isn't completely required, but is, is common. Okay. So these fragility functions now are plotted in the figure to the right, and these are fragility functions for peak ground acceleration. So I've got that uh, used rather than the generic IM here. And we can see what's going on here. So we've got for damage state one over on the left in, in the blue, we've got the highest probabilities of damage for a given peak ground acceleration value relative to the other damage states. Right? So it's relatively easy to get to a minor damage state compared to a complete damage state. So it would make sense that the probabilities are higher. And this blue fragility function is saying this is the probability of being in a minor damage state or worse, right? If we look back up at the fragility function, we've got a greater than or equal to sign up here. Right, so we've still got binary outcomes. Either I'm not reaching that damage state or I'm reaching that damage state or worse. And so I've got binary yes, no for these two outcomes. If I go to the plot again to the next fragility function for damage state two in red, the probabilities are lower, right? It's less likely that I'm gonna get to the moderate damage state, but this is moderate damage state or worse. And that'll continue on and so on. So the probabilities are going down with the more severe damage states. Now, if I want to know about a specific damage state, so if I want the probability that the damage state is equal to DS1, that I'm specifically in minor damage and not worse. Uh, so I could find what's the probability that the damage state is greater than or equal to damage state one minus the probability that the damage state is greater than or equal to damage state two, right? And then about all given I have equals X. So there's conditioning all, on all those. I'll just save that uh, writing to make it brief. Okay. And so that's what's going on, for example, in this kind of bracketed part of the plot shown here, that for a peak ground acceleration of 0.5, if we evaluate this 
fragility function with the given parameters, you know, equaling or exceeding damage state one is, gives me a probability of 0 0.87. Equaling or exceeding damage state two gives me a probability of 0 0.57. So equaling damage state one must be a probability of 0.3 because equaling damage state one is the only outcome that's in the first term, but not in the second term. All right, so we, we formulate in fragility functions in terms of greater than or equal to's, but we can always find the probability of observing a specific damage state just by taking these differences. Okay, so that's some basics on fragility functions. We can do the same thing in the next video with consequence functions.